Hi, and welcome to our presentation uh, entitled Securing Over-the-Air Firmware Updates for Industrial Internet of Things Devices. Uh, the reason we selected to do this presentation is we believe that it's representative of a lot of uh, IIoT uh, connectivity. Um, we're specifically from the water sector, uh, and uh, we'll talk more of that as we go on. My name is Kenneth Crowther. I'm the product security leader for Xylem's Applied Water Systems uh, and America's commercial teams. Um, and my name is Radhika. Uh, I'm a product security engineer here at Xylem. So, so let's get into it. The first, the first thing we want to establish is we want to make sure that we don't scare anyone by talking about cyber exposure, about cyber uh, uh, vulnerability. And so we want to we want to remind everyone why IIoT is emerging, why connected digital systems. So in the water sector, uh, we believe that we're super lean. Um, we can deliver uh, one ton of clean water to every household in the United States, for example, for $3 a ton. And, uh, and then we can reclaim those tons of uh, material uh, for, uh, within that same price. Right, so we're delivering and reclaiming a ton of material all for $3 a ton, and I don't think any industry can claim that leanness, and yet it's not good enough. Right, three in 10 people still lack access to safe drinking water, six in 10 people still lack access to safely managed sanitation, and digital solutions are a key to making a transformation that can make our sector even more lean. And so just as a reminder of uh, where we're coming from, there's an example from South Bend, Indiana that's, that's uh, uh, informative in this, in this case. So South Bend, Indiana, they had this big problem. They were dumping about a dozen Olympic-sized swimming pools uh, worth of, swim, uh, of sewage into the St. Joseph's River uh, every day. And uh, this was resulting in uh, concentrations of uh, bacteria like E. coli. Um, growing, it was reducing the, the ability to use that water for recreation. Um, and, uh, and it was starting to concern EPA among other uh, organizations. They estimated what it would take to rebuild their, their uh, wastewater system. And it was gonna cost on the order of uh, 800, 900 million dollars, right? Just, just shy of a billion dollars. For a small town like South Bend, Indiana, that ends up being something like, um, $10,000, $11,000 per person, which was just unaffordable. And so what we did instead was we installed 120 sensors. These are flow meters, uh, uh, level sensors. And uh, this helped us to understand the condition of the wastewater system. And what we realized was that there was a lot of unused capacity. And what we really just needed uh, in terms of uh, concrete um, was a $200, $300 uh, installation in order to make this uh, uh, infrastructure more navigable. In the end, this saved over half a billion dollars in capital expenditures. Um, the sensors then became part integrated in, into this control system where the sensors are basically kind of like bidding for downstream capacity. So as flow, as level is rising, as flow is increasing, they're starting to value that portion of the wastewater infrastructure, starting to value that downstream capacity more. And it's now bidding for this downstream capacity. And the result is, is that we can use the infrastructure that already existed um, more successfully. And, uh, and, even, and with this uh, operational technology, they're now saving 1.5 million per year, in addition to the half a billion that they saved in um, capital investments. This is reducing overflow into the St. Joseph's River by a billion gallons a year. It completely eliminates overflow during the drier uh, seasons of the year um, and reduces it by like 70 or 80% during the, the wettest seasons. Uh, e. coli concentrations have dropped by 50%. And all of this was made possible because of connected digital solutions. Um, in fact, uh, the, the, the gateways and the cloud processing still happens on our site where we're monitoring and, uh, and helping to continuously improve what's going on and securing this. And so I, I wanna make sure that we establish this up front because as we talk about IIoT and we talk about some of the threats and attack vectors and stuff like that, I wanna make sure that we remind ourselves why we're doing that. So the second thing is that 
connected digital infrastructure does result in uh, additional exposures and emerging threats. And so uh, we're monitoring uh, right now in the water sector seven threat activity groups that have specifically um, exercised certain tactics and techniques against water technologies. Um, and, uh, and we're watching out for other threat activity groups that have techniques and procedures for attacking industrial control systems. And so, for example, uh, Dragos released this report and they talked about these two groups, Magnalium and Raspite, that are specifically targeting safety systems. Um, and this is something that we're aware of. And as we talk about uh, attacks and protecting um, controllers uh, for these over-the-air firmware updates, um, we're acknowledging the fact that these tactics and techniques exist. And in fact, these techniques have gone into informing uh, what we um, want to protect against. And so this, this example shows an activity by Raspite, um, wherein they masqueraded as this trilog.exe um, uh, program. They were successful at uh, overriding uh, parts of the firmware in this uh, Schneider Electric Triconic system. Um, and uh, while they probably intended to do some worse damage, it successfully shut down the plant. Um, and the plant shut down multiple times before they realized that, uh, that there's something, something is going on, something is fundamentally wrong with the, uh, the product. And uh, after going to Schneider Electric, realized that uh, this was malware that's targeted to modify the firmware of the system. And so as we talk about over-the-air firmware updates, we're specifically paying attention to these kinds of things. Um, and this is representative of a problem that we definitely want to avoid, right? We don't want anyone overriding the firmware, particularly uh, to result in any kind of unsafe uh, activities. So, but this, this is part of this larger problem. Uh, we uh, recognize that uh, there were a trillion dollars, tr a trillion US dollars in losses uh, last year because of various kinds of cyber breaches. The average cost of an incident was $500,000. Um, in the water sector, there were reports uh, of over 150 products having some sort of vulnerabilities. The water wastewater sector is the third most targeted sector of all uh, 16 critical infrastructures that are categorized in the US. Um, we're right now tracking seven activity groups um, that have tactics and techniques that are or have been used against uh, water or wastewater uh, facilities or water technology, um, and so on and so forth. Right? This is this is a cyber summit, and uh, you guys recognize these kinds of things, and they exist in the water sector as well. And so, so why have we picked over-the-air firmware updates uh, as kind of the focus? Um, and uh, how do we believe that this can overall help improve the security of um, critical infrastructure as we move and transform? our infrastructure to become more digital and more connected. Um, so the first thing is to, to recognize that there has digital, connected digital infrastructure is starting kind of a uh, transformation. Um, so on the left side of this shows the traditional Purdue model. And in this model, the utility owns all of uh, the, the utility or the plant or whatever, right? The operator um, owns all of the infrastructure. And down at the bottom are their physical processes, their sensors, actuators, valves, drives. They have intelligent controllers, right? Or just controllers that have been programmed with logic. Um, above that, they have their supervisory controllers, their SCADA systems, their HMIs, uh, their historians, right? This, this overall constitutes the operation. Um, these then are, are uh, part of a, an area network or, or a plant network. Um, where they can pivot across what they need to for the purpose of operations and control. There's usually some kind of a gap, uh, demilitarized zone, uh, a, um, some kind of logical segmentation. Then a connection to the enterprise um, where they use this information to start scheduling logistics, billing, uh, doing the, uh, the business side. Um, and what we're starting to see if you 
move over to the right side of the screen is a fundamental shift in how this architecture is working. And we just pull out two examples. Um, in some cases, there is an industrial gateway and that industrial gateway is owned some kind of a jump post or something like that. And it's owned and maintained by the vendor. And it then allows for exchange of information back to a cloud environment. Because, because that data is now in that cloud environment, it allows for continuous improvement, constant uh, monitoring, new features, um, more rapid implementation, a realization uh, and adaptation to what customers need um, across various types of systems. Um, all of these uh, features that we've been talking about with respect to digital twins and things like that. And what we're starting to see is a need for this additional communication, which then results in these added exposures. The utility no longer owns all the infrastructure, but uh, it also means that there needs to be a partnership in how we execute on cybersecurity. And so what we're gonna talk about is how firmware, over-the-air firmware updates um, provides a, like a case study to look at this uh, uh, communication back and forth between the utility and the vendor and um, results in a, a concept or a set of concepts on how we can protect this uh, additional exposure that's created, um, and then it and then it reveals some things that we uh, would like to conclude with about partnering uh, across the industry for the purpose of cybersecurity. So, so this is our rough sketch of uh, firmware um, over-the-air firmware updates, which we'll refer to as FOTA as we go. And uh, I'm going to let Radhika talk about the details, but I want to point out first that um, there's three different environments um, that, we're, that we're spanning, right? The product maker environment where we're developing and experimenting and uh, testing the firmware, the cloud provider environment that's providing the infrastructure um, and uh, the, uh, the, the storage and the servers and the capability in order to make connections out uh, to these IIoT devices. And then there's the, the operator site, right? The, the industry site where the actual operations are happening and where the device sits. So with that, I'll turn it over to Radhika to talk about some details and, and some threat uh, modeling. So looking at this picture, you know, the firmware update process over the air uh, goes something like this. Um, it starts with the development environment um, and the developers test the firmware updates and gets them ready for the build. And then once they merge the code with the master branch, that triggers an update process. The firmware is compiled and using the key management server from the cloud, they sign the firmware packages and then store them in the cloud. There will also be some kind of configuration files that specify the firmware versions, the compatible devices, the rollout methods, and so on. Once these firmware packages are ready for the gateway, there are two ways that the gateway can receive those updates. They can be pushed to the cloud, to the gateway, or the gateway can keep checking for updates. And once it gets the updates from the cloud storage, it will send to the device. Now on the device end, it'll verify the hash of the package and then try to upgrade. If there are any errors in the upgrade process, they'll roll back the changes. So this is kind of like a data flow diagram or a DFD for the firmware update process over the air. Notice that for the gateway and the key management piece, there's a orange outline. We're trying to indicate that they have a shared responsibility um, within the bigger picture. When we try to make sure that the entire process of FOTA is secure, we have to make sure that each of these individual pieces is secure. And to manage that security of these components, there's a shared responsibility. The gateway or the mobile device that's on the industrial site is owned by the site, but the security of the device and the firmware update are managed by the product vendor. So there's a shared responsibility between the site and the product maker. Similarly, for the key management piece, 
that's um, sitting on the cloud, the cloud service provider and the product vendors have a shared responsibility. Um, uh, the key management solutions are provided by the cloud service provider and the management and the rotation of the skills. And all that is handled by the product maker. Next slide, please, Kenneth. So now that we have a DFD, we can do a threat model. This involves identifying the threats in a very structured way and then listing out the security controls that address those threats. The threats we see on the right side are based on a stride model, which stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. These are some types of threats that we can look for in the solution. Um, notice that we don't have to use stride, but it can be any kind of threat modeling process. Um, it might be MITRE's common weakness enumeration model, CWE, or MITRE's attack framework, or anything else. Stride is just one way of standardizing this process. And then once these threats are documented, these are mitigated by enforcing some security controls within the process. These security controls become part of our trust model of the solution. The trust model is generally built on security principles like authentication, integrity, non-repudiation, confidentiality, availability, and authorization. These security principles in, will ensure that the firmware code is handled confidentially, that it implements access control on the code, and it ensures that there is no tampering of the code, and also that all the useful details are Locked. We can do this kind of threat modeling on the solution for Foda. Uh, next slide, please, Kenneth. So here in the, on this slide, we have listed some threats for all three buckets, the product maker bucket, the pipeline, and the cloud, or in the operations of the industry side. Using the stride model, we can list out some of these threats for each of these buckets. This list is not exhaustive, but it gives you an idea. One of the threats is an attacker spoofing a developer's identity and being able to publish their own firmware. This disrupts the product maker's publishing process. Or we may have a spoofed FOTA server that is serving malicious firmware updates. Or an attacker may be able to tamper with the firmware in the development environment or have tampered updates available on the, um, in the cloud for the endpoints or tamper on the way to the devices. And when it comes to reputation, we can have some updates that are not tracked using proper logging. And that can happen either on the cloud FOTA server or on the devices. We may have some counterfeit firmware available, or a man in the middle may have may be able to get a copy of the firmware and then make some changes. There may be some denial of service using flood of requests or very large update packages. Or when it comes to elevation of privileges, we may have some admin users doing some unauthorized operations or someone getting unauthorized access to data in the cloud. These are some threats that we can list, but let's see how they can impact the FOTA solution. Let's pick a couple of threats as an example and walk through this. Um, let's say in the cloud storage, there's an elevation of privilege issue and an internal user who has access to this storage server is able to access other servers and other people's data. Because of this issue, they may be able to um, spoof the firmware publisher's identity and maybe alter the firmware updates stored on the cloud server. Or they may be able to break the firmware updates configuration and control process. So because of that, can you go to the next slide, please? So now we have these two threats that we are focusing on, the internal users getting elevation of privileges and 
um, being able to spoof a developer's identity. If a user is able to spoof and get elevated privileges, it means that there are no checks to see whether that user is authorized to do those privileged actions. They're able to get some admin or super user privileges to access those resources that they're not supposed to. Or another way is to make some lateral movement or some side channel attacks and being able to access those resources. To prevent this, we can have some role-based access control on every operation performed on the photo server. And admin operations can also be authenticated using some multi-factor authentication to ensure that they are who they are. Multi-factor authentication will also reduce the risk of threats from weak or shared credentials. Network segmentation and firewalling will also help in preventing that kind of lateral movement from of users from one server to another. And on the uh, product maker side, we can also add some protections to prevent a spoofing of a developer's identity. If a user is able to spoof the firmware publisher's identity, they can corrupt the firmware con uh, con configuration and control process too. So to prevent this, user access to the build process must be strictly controlled and monitored. And the approval process to merge the code into the master can include more than one person. So the idea is that spoofing one person's identity might be easy, but spoofing two people at the same time will be way more difficult. So even if we take just two threads listed here, we have some of these security controls that we can put in place to prevent these two threads. Similarly, we can come up with these threads and uh, in the end, synthesize all these into um, actionable measures that we can take. Let's take another example. Uh, let's say someone is able to push rogue firmware updates to the cloud photo server. Um, it's possible that uh, the firmware updates are not signed by the developer. Then we may be able to craft these firmware update packages, load on this because there are no checks on the endpoint to verify the authenticity of the update package. In that case, a very simple test case to crash the endpoint is by sending very large update packets. Because even if there is signature verification on the end, by the time it downloads the entire large firmware update package, the gateway may become unresponsive, potentially draining its battery. This can lead to a denial of service on the, in the industrial side. Next slide, please. Now let's consider these two threats, rogue firmware updates and really large update files. If an attacker is able to push rogue firmware updates to the cloud server, it shows that the cloud environment can be tampered with. So apart from controls like authorization and firewalling and authentication controls, signing the packages by the firmware publisher will help in reducing these threats. On the receiving end, the end device, it can verify the signature of the publisher before upgrading. And then to mitigate the risk of having very large update files, if the firmware update is really large in size, when the gateway downloads it without checking about the size, the battery may drain because of excessive processing load, or it can use up all the storage and break the gateway. Let's say instead of a gateway, we have a mobile device and probably it has more storage and it won't be a problem on the mobile device. But then when the update package goes to the end device, it may have the same problem. You can use up all the storage and then break the device. So to prevent these threats, we can have validation checks on the file size before downloading and then version tracking to make sure that the end device is 
receiving the firmware updates that it is compatible with, and then logging all these operations on the photo server. Can you go to the next slide, please? This way we can document all these different threats and then come up with all the different security controls to prevent these. And then we try to synthesize all these protection mechanisms into four different buckets. And this will help in building some cybersecurity into the photo process. Securing photo process requires what we call a multi-barrier approach or defense in depth. We'll give you water, wastewater as an example. In water, wastewater monitoring system, there are different layers of security built to the system. We start with the legislation, have making laws governing the water treatment and monitoring. Then when it comes to the local monitoring authorities, all the neighboring monitoring authorities share data among each other and the local monitoring authority will make some decisions based on the data it is receiving from the upstream monitoring authorities. And then they make adjustments as needed. And then the water treatment facility, even that one has several layers of add, um, added for redundancy and uh, um, approval process for this water treatment. And the process is monitored to make sure that the water is safe for human consumption. And then it goes to uh, the end users. Throughout this process, there are several layers of checks and approvals and monitoring. We'll apply the same principles of multi-barrier approach to our FOTA cybersecurity. Next slide, please. So, um... Before we go to the next slide, I just want to emphasize that um, that this multi-barrier approach is not only on the backs of the utilities. So even though the utilities are the ones actually doing the treatment and frequently own the, the transport and delivery infrastructure, um, and there is a multi-layer tech stack to do that, uh, this is a partnering effort between other utilities that uh, provide uh, that are also using a similar source between the municipality or the community, and uh, and so we're going to start realizing that some of these partnerships are necessary to secure IIoT uh, in our case. So so we're going to talk about these different layers. The first thing to talk about is that we want to ensure that the device can verify the authenticity and integrity of the firmware. And there's two key principles um, that, uh, er, that all the security of the device is based on. The first is the idea of the root of trust. And the second, um, and this has to do with how the, the chip sits on the actual board itself. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the next is the chain of trust how that root of trust is uh, uh, helps to make sure that we have an authentic um, and an untampered bootloader and how that bootloader helps to make sure that we have an authentic and untampered firmware and how that firmware then has built-in procedures to make sure that the update uh, uh, component and the communications components um, are constantly secure and that the features that they need in order to establish secure communication or to verify the authenticity and integrity of, a, of an update um, are intact. So the first thing is this idea of root of trust. Um, so the idea is that when, uh, when there's a reset function, there's a very limited amount of memory or capability uh, that, uh, that a chip uh, can deal with. And because of that, it provides some inherent uh, trustworthiness that we need to learn how to take advantage of. Um, in some architectures, um, there's only one function that it can run and there's some immutable ROM bootloader. But even when there's this immutable bootloader, there's typically like a segment in there for, or a slice of memory in there for uh, verification. Um, 
And while the default might be some basic CRC checksum, that, that uh, set of features can typically be replaced with a public key and, a sep and, and some sort of uh, a verification algorithm uh, in order to verify the firmware. Um, in other cases uh, where there is this basic uh, immutable ROM bootloader, it provides an opportunity uh, in the architecture for establishing a secondary bootloader where you verify the integrity of the bootloader. The bootloader then has public key and advanced uh, crypto uh, methods for verifying signed firmware. And the firmware then is able to load a validated uh, and verified update process and communication driver um, and is able to access uh, certificates and other things that might be involved in um, th those exchanges. Um, so this is the idea that there's this root of trust um, and that at each layer in the, the loading of the firmware, um, you're carefully assuring uh, integrity and authenticity and then loading the next, loading the next feature. Um, there's also a, 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 what's becoming more and more popular are these uh, additional chips, trusted platform modules, where they've already thought through all of the uh, uh, root of trust and uh, crypto, excel, uh, crypto uh, requirements, uh, tamper resistance, redundancy, resilience of, uh, uh, of install and rollbacks and things like that. Um, and there's a, spe a special set of functions that uh, exist already um, on these, uh, these chips that can now be established independent of the, um, the, the basic mechanism. So underlying all of this, though, is um, a, 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 a cryptological schema, which uh, can be across a number of algorithms. Hopefully, um, uh, we're looking for ones that are approved by or consistent with FIPS 140-2 uh, or FIPS 140-3, um, uh, preferably maybe even validated uh, through that uh, FIPS 140-2 or-3 process. Um, but even if the algorithm and the process and the architecture is all revealed, the process can still be safe as long as we're protecting uh, that private key that's used to sign the bootloader or to sign the firmware or to uh, countersign a certificate uh, request. And uh, so in this process, we need to pay special attention with how we're using third parties. Um, if the third party develops our firmware and then hands over the firmware with their private key, now that key is not only do we not know where it's been and we have not had control over it, but now it's been transferred um, through some kind of sharing mechanism that was established. And so as, as uh, product vendors, we should get in the habit of making sure there's enough uh, agility in the way that our product is architected such that when the product becomes ours, we can generate our own private key, we can export uh, the public key and encode it properly so that it can be involved in the uh, bootloaders verification processes um, for loading this firmware. The, the last piece to think about is that uh, sometimes things fail and sometimes they fail for unexpected reasons. Um, and so the last part of security of this device is that we wanna make sure that we don't accidentally brick our device through some kind of uh, firmware update process that goes wrong in an unexpected way. And so on the one hand, we're gonna be doing a lot of testing, but on the other hand, we wanna make sure that we have rollback and fallback uh, conditions so that we can make sure that if, if firmware does load and the bootloader rejects it, um, uh, or if it's rejected in a verification process before it even resets or reboots, um, we wanna make sure that that doesn't disrupt the operation uh, of the device. So, so one last thing about verifying the high level firmware is, uh, we need to get in the habit of making sure that this chain of trust goes all the way from the bottom to the top. And that means that uh, we need to assure that we're not using obsolete uh, uh, function, functions. Uh, many of these obsolete functions uh, um, 
are not careful with uh, buffer or with memory or with the way that uh, um, uh, elements are transitioned from the transceiver chip or the uh, into this update process into the firmware storage. Um, and we need to make sure that uh, every aspect of the firmware is being uh, tested through a component analysis or through a static uh, analyzer that's consistent um, with the, uh, the, the whatever the function set is that, the, that are being provided to us by the chip vendor or that are consistent with the architecture that we're working with. And so, so this is the first, uh, uh, or at least one important layer of trust. And this is completely under the control of the product maker, right? The product maker. We can decide on the architecture. Um, we do work with the chip vendor in order to make sure that uh, we understand bootloader, firmware, where we can stick in verification, how we encode the uh, public keys in order to make this verification work. Um, we might need to work with manufacturers uh, so that uh, we, for a communications driver, for example, we want, might want to make sure that the private key um, uh, for that establishing secure communications is generated on the device itself. Um, and then it generates a key signing request. We send it over to our certificate authority to countersign it. And that, that way we have a, a chain of trust and communications that then sits in the, on the device in the form of a certificate. And now we don't have to give our third party manufacturer uh, for that communications piece access to all of our basic uh, development systems. Um, so this is the idea, this root of trust and a chain of trust. And now we have a device with firmware that uh, is, is ready to start accepting these kinds of uh, over-the-air firmware updates. Um, but that's just, that's just one layer in this uh, multi-barrier system. Next one deals with cryptography encryption and integration of TLS into the communication. This will ensure that the firmware is protected from the time of compilation and signing and then stored secure, encrypted in the data storage and then transmitted securely using encrypted channels of communication. To do this, we start off with a very hardened server. We remove unnecessary ports and services and have a minimal attack surface. And then we encrypt the database that is used for storage. And access to this storage service will be restricted to only those people that need it. And the communication channels between the one component to the other must be encrypted using TLS. Only the latest and greatest encryption standards like AES and TLS 1.2 or higher with strong ciphers are used here. And on the endpoint side, we have the chain of trust established with the product developer using secure proof, like Kenneth explained. It has the public key of the developer in a protected memory that can be tampered with, like a trusted platform module. And then once the device receives the signed update package, it can validate the authenticity and integrity of the package and then proceed with the update. This will ensure that the, the, the communication channels and the data storage are encrypted. So the next piece, uh, so, so now, now we have a device that is set up to be able to verify authenticity integrity. We have this root of trust and this chain of trust, and we're chaining that trust all the way across the, the uh, communication pathways. Um, so now what we want to do is we want to take the humans out of the loop and we want to take the variability out of the loop. Uh, this makes it then much more uh, simple to protect uh, from the standpoint of we're going to log everything that we can and we're going to be able to make sure that uh, nothing unusual is going on and we're not going to have humans coming in and doing the unusual things. Um, and uh, this, this requires to, us to kind of zoom in just a little bit um, because the thing about building firmware is that sometimes we need a chip specific uh, toolbox. Uh, sometimes we need a specific kind of compiler. Um, sometimes we might need uh, um, something that uh, the vendor uh, 
the, the chip vendor has helped create um, in order to encode uh, things properly or to take advantage of some kind of uh, uh, architectural features. And so um, unfortunately, with a lot of these uh, firmware builds, uh, we're not just going to be able to take some kind of pipeline off the shelf um, and apply it. Um, but, uh, but there is value to doing this automation because we're taking humans out and we're taking out a lot of the variability. And so the first piece has to do with how we build this, uh, this build container. So in this pipeline, we can have uh, 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 some kind of a merge to master uh, kick off some kind of automation process. And what we want to do is to make sure that uh, this build environment is not going to be persistent. Um, we also want to make sure it's going to be built on a stack that is uh, going to be up to date at the very beginning. So we're not going to necessarily want to create one image now and then use it six months from now and then use it 10 months from now. We're going to want to maybe go and get uh, Ubuntu, uh, the latest version that's still supported with the most uh, vulnerabilities uh, patched. We might go and get something like Segger and um, have it set up to have the correct toolbox for whatever the the, uh, the chip vendor and the, the special tools that we might uh, want. And it's now only going to be temporary while we're building, signing, um, packaging, and then pushing this package. And then it's going to be uh, blown away everything except the logs. So the second thing that we want to think about is that if we're going to do it this way, we're going to need credentials to push and pull the information that we need, we want to make sure those credentials are not going to be stored in the pipeline automation script and we're, that they're not going to be stored uh, in the container that gets built. Um, and so this means we are typically going to need some kind of a separate secrets manager. Um, there are some secrets managers that are available uh, through cloud vendors. And there are some ways that these can be uh, built in in a separate way for common pipelines like like uh, Bitbucket and things like that. Um, the key is that we want to make sure that these are in separate places so that they're called for uh, when they're needed. They're utilized in a way that uh, is not logged, right? So that the transfer of these, uh, we want to make sure we're not echoing, printing, catting, whatever um, these, uh, these credentials. Uh, if we're you're doing that during debugging, uh, we need to make sure we remove all that. Um, and then what happens is we're able to now uh, separate out this. So we have a container that's temporary, that's uh, standing up, doing the compilation, and, and so forth. Um, and then we have these credentials that are separate. The next thing is we got to think about how we're going to protect that private key. Remember, that's the, that's the most important piece um, for our entire device security. Um, and so the rule of thumb is that, ideally, wherever we generate the private key, it never moves. Um, and ideally, wherever we generate the private key has layers of protection in place uh, to keep that private key safe. Um, but that also might mean that we need to have a little agility in how we actually do the signing of the firmware. Um, so for a, a medium assurance uh, process, it's possible that you might even grab that key, temporarily just use it, and then make sure that you can have a deletion process. But for anything that's uh, critical, you need to make sure that you're adjusting that process so that, for example, you can generate a hash of the firmware, send the hash over to the key management device, have the hash signed, return that signature, and be able to append it to the firmware in a way that the bootloader verification algorithm is going to recognize it. Um, so as we move further over, um, uh, one of the things that we talked about, and this becomes important for automation, is that we don't want to put everything on this device. Um, sometimes these devices are going to be remote. Sometimes they're going to have very little bandwidth. Uh, sometimes they're going to have uh, uh, they're going to result uh, in operating on a battery. Um, and uh, so, to the extent possible, we want to think of where the best places uh, to do this verification is. Um, typically. In a secure boot uh, uh, architecture, you load this new firmware into a queue, and uh, and then it's not verified until the next time that you boot up, and that time, that way you don't need multiple verification uh, 
programs in memory. And uh, if the bootloader doesn't verify the firmware, it just loads the common firmware and clears the queue. If it passes the verification, it loads that new firmware um, and, uh, and eliminates the existing uh, firmware, clearing up that memory space. Um, but somewhere along the lines, we want to make sure that we're not putting everything on that bootloader so that it doesn't necessarily have to get all the way down the line and potentially hogging bandwidth and, uh, um, and using, up, uh, using up more power than we really want. And so that's, in some cases, this might be done on the gateway. In some cases, there might be a, a, a shadow uh, a configuration that's on a cloud service. Um, and uh, where it's doing some verification before it even uh, replaces that uh, kind of shadow configuration, which is what helps say to the, the gateway and the device that uh, it's ready for an update. Um, the final thing is that uh, on September 22nd, uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security, uh, DHS, CISA, um, they published these industrial control system performance uh, objectives. And one of these objectives was this thing called crypto agility. The idea is that at some point in the future, you might want to swap out the algorithm that you use. You might want to swap out the keys that you use. And so this now, as we're running through this uh, pipeline, as we're running through this process of trying to automate this pipeline, that uh, starts to uh, bring to surface a couple uh, features that we might want to start thinking about. Um, the first is, do we want to be able to swap out the keys? Uh, if we want to swap out the keys, remember that that means we might have to modify the bootload. Well, we will have to modify the bootloader, right? Because the bootloader contains that public key for verification. Um, and uh, and that's the case. If that's the case, we need to make sure that our processes are set up for being able to do that bootloader update and not just the firmware update. Um, and uh, the other thing is that. There's this question of whether we're going to, at some future date, want to swap out the algorithm. Um, and we don't have a lot of experience with swapping out <laughs> algorithms. Uh, we have a hard enough time getting everything to work just right <laughs> with the way that it is. Um, but that is something that we should probably start putting in our mind, is how much agility do we want to give um, to our devices uh, in the future? Um, and do we want to be able to, uh, to have uh, some, some level of crypto agility? Um, the last thing I'll mention about that crypto agility is that typically on the cloud photo server is going to be some kind of configuration file. And we're going to want to make sure that we understand the compatibility, right? If we change the bootloader uh, because we're swapping out this uh, public key uh, and then we're going to start signing firmware with a new key, we need to make sure that there's a compatibility uh, chain um, so that if there's an update that has to happen, that uh, the new firmware is being loaded on the correct bootloader um, because after our installed base is tens of thousands, um, uh, we don't wanna necessarily have to keep this in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and so we're gonna wanna put that in this uh, configuration file and we're gonna wanna test against uh, these uh, compatibilities when we're doing that testing on the development side before we do the merge to master with it, which then basically kicks the humans out, uh, out of the loop. Uh, and the last thing, just to emphasize, because it fits into the next piece, is that we're going to be logging all of this stuff. Um, and because the human's not in the loop and because it's automated, we know what we should be saying. We know what should be happening. And so, so this, is, this is the third piece, is uh, uh, taking the human out and automating this uh, firmware pipeline. Finally, the last piece covers all the rest of the security measures that counter the strike threats like role-based access control for the build and sign process. Access should be restricted to only those people that need it. And even to those people, there should be you know, granular access control, read-only versus read-write, something like that. And then the firmware update must be compiled and tested properly. Uh, Merging a code branch into the master branch must include two or more people in the approval process to make sure that there are additional eyes on the test and verification process. Where there is an admin operation or a super user privileged operation, there must be multi-factor authentication to make sure that the, there is a 
reduced risk from shared credentials or weak credentials. All the FODA operations must be logged, again, like we talked about earlier. All this must be logged so that given the logs, one can easily piece together what happened, who did that, and when and why, and what the status of that operation is. But we should remember not to have any sensitive information in the logs, like, like the passwords, right? On the device side, there must be verifications to check the versions of the update so that um, any incorrect firmware update won't corrupt the device or break the device. And so by having this process, we can automate this so that as new firmware packages are added, as new versions are added, as the keys are rotated, there won't be any downtime or any risk of security threats. And by implementing all these security measures, we can have a fully automated build pipeline for firmware updates that go from the firmware vendor to the cloud and then get pushed to the devices. Next slide, please. So, so we've talked about four big topics. Um, and uh, just to kind of recap, right? First, we talked about how important to connected digital systems are because they are the things that are gonna generate uh, value and help the water sector become increasingly lean. Um, the second thing is that we did talk about how there's these emerging threats um, and uh, that this is creating new exposures. We went through this threat modeling process that generated dozens of attack, uh, attack vectors um, with uh, multiple dozens of controls. Um, and then what we tried to do is synthesize it into these four main pieces. The first one is the device. You've got to have a root of trust and a chain of trust Everything needs to be signed uh, with, uh, with uh, private keys that you protect uh, somewhere outside of the device. Um, and that will help to maintain the authenticity and integrity of everything. And then you have a chain up to that, that uh, update process. The next thing is protecting from source to destination, right? These communication channels. The third thing is automating this, protecting it from people making sure that we know exactly what's supposed to happen, how it's gonna happen, taking the humans out of it and then logging everything. And finally, we need to make sure that each piece of this process is hardened um, and uh, that privileges are separated, that there's multi-factor authentication, right? That, that everything uh, can be hardened at each aspect of this. Um, and this is how over the air firmware updates happen. And this enables us to have this agile uh, infrastructure that now we can continue to deliver additional features um, and modify things in a much less expensive way, but in a way that then results in this kind of shared responsibility. Um, and that's where we kind of want to end. Traditionally, so we've viewed cybersecurity kind of in these four buckets, secure the product on the left-hand side, secure the deployment, right? The architecture of the actual operations network that's on the right-hand side, commission it secure, secure, then monitor the security and the health of the system, right? Install patches, updates, maintain it. And then at the very top, monitor for incidents and respond to them appropriately. Typically the product maker has only had to exist over on the left-hand side, make secure products. Worry about, let the integrator worry about secure deployment, let the operator worry about uh, health monitoring and response. But what's starting to happen is with IIoT, the product owner is now having to take care of a lot more of this. Um, and this is an important piece. If we want to have this digital transformation work, um, we as product owners and vendors, uh, we need to make sure that we're doing our part. So in this case, we're now securing the product we're establishing an architecture for secure over-the-air firmware update deployment. We're making sure that we test and validate each of the controls across that entire architecture. We're then monitoring the firmware transit. We're monitoring the firmware uh, update process. And we're keeping our, uh, and that, and we, we, ha we have our, uh, you know, product security operation center, our PSOC for doing that. And then we're monitoring our product, our product health, 
the vulnerabilities in our product. We're making sure that we can respond and send these updates quickly. And we're participating with our customers when they have an incident response, when they have an incident that involves one of our products. And that takes, uh, that's what we use our P-CERT for our product security incident response team. And so we're now starting to have to share that responsibility of this security diamond with uh, the, the, uh, the customers or the operators. And I think that is uh, the direction that things are heading. Um, and I think that that, uh, that shared responsibility will become a good thing and help us to solve, uh, solve these problems uh, that we have in water with secure connected digital infrastructure. So we're available to take questions. We'll be online. I know this is a recorded, uh, this is a recorded session, but we're available to take questions uh, or you can contact us uh, through our email addresses uh, that are listed there. We'd happy to collaborate uh, and do anything that we can to help promote this idea of secure digital infrastructure. We would be really interested in your comments. Um, part of the reason why we put this presentation together was to, I mean, I know it didn't go into every technical detail of actual implementation, um, but we would be interested in anything that we're missing, anything that we haven't thought of, um, and uh, or collaborating with anyone who's also trying to think through this process. With that, we thank you for your attention and uh, glad that uh, we could be part of this uh, Texas Cyber Summit. Thank you.